Hello everyone and welcome to Ebenezer Church and to our online Sunday service. A special welcome to any guests or visitors who are watching just now. How are you all doing? It was just under two weeks ago that some of the Covid restrictions were lifted, enabling us to meet outdoors as groups of six or as two households. How wonderful! Just in time for the Easter break. And then what happens? We have freezing cold weather. Never mind. Tomorrow some more restrictions are being relaxed and I for one I'm having a haircut this week. I mean, just look at this mop. Of course, we're halfway through the school holidays, so I do hope that our children and families are doing well just now. My name is Derek. I'm one of the church leaders here at Ebby, and it's a real privilege to be with you today. Just a few notices for you. Now, I want to let you know that at our church building on Filton Avenue, we want to install a new disabled access ramp. The existing one is wholly unsuitable. And in order to give people the opportunity to give, noting that a lot of people from the local area, the local community, use our building in many different ways, we have created a crowdfunder page. And if you would like to financially give to this cause, then you can use the crowdfunder page or you can give directly to Ebby Church. Mark your gift for the purpose of the new ramp. And if you can give tax efficiently, please do add gift aid to your gift. That just adds further money to the contribution. The second thing I want to mention is the noise weekends coming up for the 1st to the 3rd of May and uh, I know it's going to be different again this year because of the pandemic but you can be involved practically and in person so I want to encourage you to sign up in fact today strictly speaking is the deadline for sign up so once this service is over why not go online and sign up as a volunteer now, what have we got in store for you today? We're going to be worshipping together and I want to encourage you to join in with the singing just where you are at home. Make a joyful noise to the Lord. Uh, then we're going to share communion together. So do find yourself some bread and wine or equivalents and join us for that. And then Emma Wall is going to be speaking to us and she's going to be opening up to us a new mini series from the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. Now, right now, we're going to hear from a few people who are going to explain to us why it's good to get involved with the noise weekend. And after that, it's straight over to the Ebby worship team. It's really fun and it offers us opportunities to get to know our neighbours better. It's fun, you'll help transform lives and you'll want to do it again. Uh, it helps people out, it helps spread God's love and it's, um, it's pretty fun. Doing the noise is important because it blesses people. The noise is important because it shares God's amazing love in the community. Doing the noise is important to show the heart of Jesus to the community and also to meet other Christians in your local area. Because God loves unity and service. We get to have fun with our friends and help people. It makes the church visible in the community. The noise represents love and togetherness in action. The noise helps our friends, our families, our neighbours see God, because they see Him through our actions. I think the noise is important because it brings people together. Because it brings all the churches together to serve the city.
Good morning, everyone. We're going to use some songs to worship God now, wherever you are. I um, just want to encourage you to, you know, if this is your first time, to s- try some of these songs. If you've been singing with us all year, then try singing a bit louder. Um, but I'm going to pray and then we'll continue. Father God, thank you for your presence wherever we're at, in whatever room or situation that we're at. Would you come? Holy Spirit, unlock praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh,
Let silence be and gaze upon your majesty. Bow the knee, let silence be, and gaze upon your majesty. We surrender, and I surrender. Oh, I surrender. Fail my heart to see the wonder of your love as I surrender all. As I surrender Yeah, Lord, would you come? Lord, as we gaze upon your majesty, even if that is the very first time, would you impact each one of us afresh? We see you, Jesus. Take us from where we are right now, Lord, and lead us. We follow, we follow you. You say, follow me, we follow. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. Good morning, Ebby. Uh, we're going to have a time of communion now. As I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how often um, in the Bible it talked about whenever you meet, uh, do this in remembrance of me, and uh, that's why we have communion and whenever we meet is something that we've come to miss a lot in the last year miss meeting on Sundays miss meeting people for meals big communal meals at Ebby there's a lot of food things I've missed miss the barbecues in the back garden but we can still take communion together just separately for the time being so that's what we're going to do now so as we remember on the Last Supper, um, Jesus turned around to his disciples and took what he had available on the table. And he took the bread and he said, this is my body and it is given for you. Um, and he broke it and he then shared that around. So we have our bread. We will share that between us. And then he took one of the cups that was part of the Passover meal and he shared that around the table, um, saying, this is my blood poured out for you. This is actually what has set in place the new covenant that means that we can live in relationship with God daily, every day, even when we're on our own. But we do that together.
thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his willingness to give up his life, to achieve far more than we could comprehend. And even now we do not fully grasp all that was going on um, on that Easter Sunday when he rose from the dead what was achieved. Lord we live in the miracle of what you have done and we are grateful. Thank you Lord. Amen. Amen. We're handing over to Emma who's going to share God's word with us this morning. Hello, I'm Emma and I'm a member of the wonderful Ebby Church family. Today I will be introducing the first of three talks on the Old Testament prophet Jeremiah. Now I don't know whether you know lots about Jeremiah, just a little bit, or actually nothing at all. But my hope and prayer is that within what I share over the next 20 minutes, you will find an overlap, a relevance, a chiming, a resonance with your life and your situation. Jeremiah was born in a village about an hour's walk from Jerusalem and felt called by God to be a prophet. Jeremiah saw his nation disintegrate morally from within and destroyed militarily from without. His ministry lasted from around 628 to 580 BC, about six centuries before the birth of Jesus. Something I feel that we have as those reading the Bible centuries after a range of people inspired by God wrote the different books within is hindsight. Yes, we see the beginning, but we also see the end. We see what transpired. Hindsight is a very illuminating thing, and I think that it shines a powerful spotlight on the past. For me, the book of Jeremiah shows that if we genuinely ask God what we need to do, we certainly need to be ready to wait and to be listening for his answer and be prepared to follow it when it comes. Today, I will be te touching on hearing from God, created by God, known by God, rescued by God and promised by God. Hopefully, my talk will be relevant for those who know a lot about Jeremiah, a little and everything in between. I'd like to start at Jeremiah 1 verse 4 which reads, the word of the Lord came to me. And I'd like to ask you the question, when do you best hear from God? When do God's words clearly come to you? Let me share a story with you. Before Christmas, Home Group watched Pete Greig's online prayer course one, which I'd, I would highly recommend if you haven't seen it before. And one of the later weeks was on something called contemplative prayer, which encourages people to go somewhere and walk in silence, looking at the world around them and listening to the sounds surrounding them, sensing what God might be saying through the natural world. My husband Johnny and I went up to the local hill at Purdown and walked in silence along the ridge there, attempting to try this idea of contemplative prayer. Suddenly looming ahead of us was the massive communication tower and I was immediately reminded of the last lines of my Christmas poem, Frequencies, which refer to the way that God, generous, spirited and gentle, grapples on our ragged frequencies and tunes in to our tattered wavelengths. And I thought about how often I seem to fiddle with the dials, give in to distractions, tune in to other wavelengths that are nothing to do with God and his ways. I don't know if you're the same. Sometimes it can be the smallest, most imperceptible of nudges that pushes us off of God's wavelength and suddenly fills our life with distracting, muffled interference. And it's all inevitably of our own doing. Sometimes I think that we've got to realise that we just need to take our hands off of the dials and stop fiddling with them and let God get through to us. I believe that God always wants to communicate with us. It's us that so often let distractions take our focus and stop us from listening when we need to. This week, you might like to take some time to think about when, where and doing what you best hear from God. You might also want to think about the things that help to restrain you from fiddling with the frequency and tuning into other channels that are distracting and tempting to you. 
and build those strategies into your everyday. Jeremiah 1 verse 5 reads, The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. These words might be very familiar to some of you. For others, it may be the first time that you've heard them. Could it be that there is something very intentional about us? That we were formed by God himself? Wow, what a thought, what a concept. How often do we wish that parts of us were different? How often do we look at the features of other people and wish that we had some of theirs instead of the ones that we've got? In my key stage two primary classrooms, something that has brought an enormous amount of joy to my heart is being around children who are happy with the skin that they are in. It's a fantastic thing to witness, and it's something that I believe passionately in. In my treasure box lies a stunning handmade poster made for me by a year five girl in one of the previous schools that I taught at. It reads, don't let anyone dim your sparkle. I so love that precious gift from a 10-year-old, and it's very meaningful to me. Each of us can really only go on the decades that we've experienced, and I feel very aware that I cannot begin to imagine what it's like for young people nowadays. So different from my experience as a teenager growing up in the 80s. Our young people on the important edge of adulthood are constantly being bombarded by airbrushed images Hundreds of selfies of seemingly perfect bikini bodies. Slick advertising campaigns with very persuasive veneers. Certain image expectations rife on social media. Their own opportunities to use filters on themselves. And the spending of an awful amount of time and emotional energy comparing themselves to others with incredibly damaging results. There is much research that says that young people's self-image is so often in tatters today. And if not in tatters, under an immense and constant amount of pressure. But this verse in Jeremiah suggests that we were formed by God himself. And it's worth thinking that maybe God actually likes us this way. Just maybe God who formed you likes you just as you are. I personally find that a great comfort and that's certainly good enough for me. I am so drawn to the second part of verse 5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I think that it's such an incredible thing to be known, truly known by others. Are you known? What about warts and all? God not only knows you, he accepts you and me, warts and all, wholeheartedly, completely, absolutely, as only he can do. And maybe that's all that you need to hear today, just that. A little story that I like to tell is that my dad's pretty well known in church circles, and all of my life I've been known in those circles as Rob Scott Cook's daughter, and it's only happened once, but once is good enough for me, that apparently at a meeting, a girl ran excitedly up to my dad and said, I don't know you, but aren't you Emma Scott Cook's dad? I loved that. And I think that quietly my dad did too. But basically, isn't it that none of us want to be reduced to only what family we come from, what our connections are? Don't we all, at the end of the day, want to be known for who we are? God certainly does that. And even better, knowing us, truly knowing us, like no one else can, warts and all, doesn't dim his love for us. Not one iota. Maybe this week you need to be reminded of that. In Jeremiah 1 verse 9, it reads, then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. God's first word spoken in this sentence is now. It's not in the future I'm going to or even I'm considering giving you something to say to those around you. No, God says now 
I have put my words in your mouth. Wow. God's words placed, entrusted to Jeremiah's mouth. Do you think that God could do the same to you? To entrust, to place his words for a time such as this with you, for you to declare and speak out. And who could you be meant to speak them out to, you might well ask. A few years ago, I was given a brilliant book written by Mark Green from the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity called Fruitfulness on the Front Line. In it, it makes clear that each one of us has a front line, a sphere of influence where we can make a difference. Mark Green writes, God the Father is interested in you and he is interested in how you use the talents, the freedoms, the opportunities, the power, the resources that he has entrusted to you. You see, each of us has a front line and each of us can have an impact on those alongside us. I've spoken before about not being thermometers that just indicate the temperature of a workplace, of a family, of a church, but instead the importance of us being thermostats that actually change the temperature of our surroundings, that actually make a difference to those around, of us being the change that we seek. Mark Green writes, Over the last 30 years, I've seen scores of people living fruitfully on their front lines, quietly doing extraordinary things in ordinary places. Often they don't think much of it, don't think that their stories are worth telling anyone, because theirs aren't the kind of stories that usually get told in our churches or in our conferences or in our magazines. And later he goes on to write that fruit is anything done with authentic love. Mother Teresa, who I admire a great deal, said, do small things with big love. Maybe you're sat there thinking that your front line isn't very extensive or impressive. You might think that it's actually not much at all. In Fruitfulness on the Front Line, Mark Green writes about Diane, who worked in an office and began to wonder how she could bring the team together a bit more and develop a greater sense of camaraderie. So one day, she took a cake that she'd made in and invited her co-workers to gather together for a short break to enjoy coffee, conversation and her cake. The team loved the opportunity to relax together and soon other people volunteered to bake something. Quickly, it became a weekly feature. What Diane had done is she'd identified an aspect of her front line that could be improved. She looked for a kingdom solution and she tried it out, putting in time and making herself a bit vulnerable in the process. Mark Green refers to Diane's mustard seed of hospitality that grew into a tree that others came to shelter under. I think that that's so fantastic and so doable. Today I ask you, what could you do with a mustard seed of hospitality? When others come to shelter under our mustard tree of hospitality, we get our authentic moments of big love to speak the words that God has entrusted to us, like he did to Jeremiah all those centuries ago, to be life-giving, thought-provoking, encouraging, challenging, empowering to those on our front lines whose lives overlap with ours. And something that I guarantee you is that you will be listened to. I believe that small things done with big love are the most impactful, memorable and transformational actions of our lives. Maybe this pandemic has altered and reduced your front line. Maybe you're confined to your house and wondering what impact you can have. The pandemic has given me a very different front line that I never expected and it might be a good one for you to think about. Being part of the Ebby Telephone Befriending Scheme is the chance for half an hour a week to listen, chat and hopefully shine a light into the darkness of those who are struggling and isolated in these strange, unprecedented times. 
You don't need a bunch of exam passes, any specific experience or any formal qualifications. All you need is a phone, a listening ear and a voice. Something to think about. For you at the moment, it might feel as if you'd prefer different front lines than the ones you've ended up with. But be assured, God can use you for good exactly where you are. In the next two Jeremiah talks, we might well hear about how Jeremiah wasn't at all happy at times with the front lines that he'd found himself on or the words that he was given to speak there. But he was a man of courage and conviction And he was prepared to speak the words that God placed in his mouth and commanded him to speak. I will finish this section with an apt quote from Fruitfulness on the front line. God is trusting us with our front lines. Trusting us with the people there. Trusting us with the challenges there. Trusting us with the tasks there. Trusting us to be his people there. Next, let's look at what God guarantees Jeremiah on his front line. In Jeremiah 1 verse 19, it reads, in relation to the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land, and that's quite some list, they will fight against you, but will not overcome you. For I am with you and will rescue you declares the Lord. And we go on in later chapters to see how Jeremiah trusted God and his declarations. I'm sure that you'll agree with me that it's easy to trust God when the sea is calm, but what about when the storm hits and we fear that we will be totally overcome by the onslaught that is unleashed? Over the past year, hasn't the whole world been hit by such a storm? Over lockdown, Johnny and I got into avidly watching a TV programme called Saving Lives at Sea, which follows RNLI lifeboat crews as they carry out rescues along Britain's coastline. Something that struck me time and time again was the sheer relief of kayakers, surfboarders, sailors at the sight of the lifeboat rounding the corner and heading towards them. Why? Because RNLI lifeboat crews know what they're doing. They're trained to save. I ask you the question, as we emerge a year on from unprecedented, insecure and stormy times, do you trust God that he knows what he's doing? Do you believe that for you, he will even turn up and rescue you from the situations that you find yourself in? Our NLI lifeboat crews don't only turn up for people who have accidentally ended up in danger. They turn up day and night for the people who have blatantly disregarded common sense, for people who have been incredibly foolish, for people who have often acted in a mind-blowingly dangerous way, for all of them. No questions asked with the absolute best of themselves. Isn't that what God's like with us? Jeremiah trusted God. Do we? Do we believe that God is willing and able to rescue us? You might want to take a moment to think about what it is that you might need to be rescued from. At this point, I want to dip into Jeremiah 2, verse 13, which reads, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot hold water. I don't know if you've ever experienced a nightmare scenario that occurs when water leaks. I'm sure that some of you listening in will already be feeling the hair standing on up on the back of your neck because you have experienced firsthand the devastating impact of an often imperceptible at first leak. I remember vividly the story told by family friends in Nailsey of when they they were excitedly preparing for the laying of a new carpet in their dining room. 
Roy had been asked to clear the room and take up the old carpet ready for the arrival of the fitters. As he was doing it, he noticed that the top of one of the nails in the floorboard was wet. As he looked at the others, all of them had a greenish tinge surrounding them. Roy got his saw and cut out a small square of floorboards in the corner of the dining room. The cavity below was swimming with water. In fact, it was discovered that all of the downstairs was sodden. The whole of the downstairs flooring would have to be replaced. For a year, big industrial dehumidifiers would be used to take moisture out of the air and Roy and Sandra would have to live for months in a state of disruption and upheaval as the problem was sorted. What would cause such a nightmare, I hear you ask? When the washing machine was fitted, a plastic clip holding one of the hoses had come loose and every washing cycle unseen, a continuous stream of water had leaked below the kitchen floor until it had wreaked total havoc. That's what leaking water does. Metaphorical broken cisterns that cannot hold water are, I believe, to be avoided at all cost. We get duped by them at our peril. As an upper primary school teacher for almost 30 years now, I feel really invested in young people that influences their development as young adults. I care about them. And I feel that the world is pushing and pushing hard broken cisterns to our children and young people. At seemingly every turn, our young people are met with slick advertising campaigns, persuasive jingles, captivating materialism, glamorous and appearingly successful social influencers encouraging every kind of lifestyle. We underestimate their power to influence at our peril. If our society continues to peddle broken cisterns in the way that it does, I fear that there is going to be a lot of rescuing needed to be carried out in the future. A few years ago, I went to an internet awareness evening at Woodlands Church, led by a police officer and a social worker. I still get shivers down my spine when I remember the clips that they played from the video games Grand Theft Auto and Call of Duty. Two years ago, one of my talks to youth leaders in Bridgewater made mention of broken cisterns. And I read this quote from an interview with 17-year-old Carl Thompson, who had become suicidal through his addiction to the video game Fortnite. He said... I want to warn kids or parents how the game Fortnite sucks you in far, far worse than any 18-rated game I've played. The idea that young kids are playing this is terrifying. In recent weeks, the setting up of the anonymous reporting website Everyone's Invited has alerted all of us to the horrifying incidents of totally inappropriate treatment of girls Unacceptable banter, misogyny, sexual assaults, several of which are now being investigated by the police, which have seemingly, under the radar, become rife and well-established in a large number of our secondary schools and educational institutions. How has this happened? When is this ever acceptable? In the last couple of weeks, I have listened to radio phone-ins where many people, from everyday listeners to experts, have rung in and talked with reams of evidence behind their comments about the damage wrought by pornography and the way it warps young people's view of women. And time and time again in recent times, I have found myself asking, where is the church's voice. For me, Jeremiah is all about the profundity, integrity, courage and power of Jeremiah's voice. God gave Jeremiah words to say, words that I've reminded you today, God himself placed in Jeremiah's mouth and expected him to say. 
because we love our communities, our workplaces, our families, our neighbours, our children, and have their best interests at heart, we must never forget that God has given his church a voice. We must use it. In closing, I want to return to Jeremiah 1, verse 19, which reads, They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. I see this as a promise from God to Jeremiah. Jeremiah trusted God, and he more than believed in God. He believed God. There's a big difference between believing in God and believing God. Do you believe God? In your life, what promises have you felt God make to you? Are you still managing to hold on to them? Sometimes people think that when people become a Christian, an easy life is guaranteed. I don't think that that's the case. But the Bible is full of things that God does guarantee that God does promise wonderful things to hold on to in the good times and the tough times promises that rescue us uphold us fill us with courage resolve and hope if you're listening in today and you're new to all this I suggest that you track someone down who loves their bible and ask them to share with you some of God's promises made to each of us. Will you join with me as I finish with a prayer? Father God, may you place your words in our mouth and may we have the courage to speak them out on our front lines, wherever they are, whoever they're with. May you grow in us a mustard tree of hospitality where others can come to shelter and hear what we've got to say. May we also be good listeners there. May we always try to do small things with big love, with an authentic love that acts as a thermostat rather than a thermometer. May we make a difference. May we be like the man of Jeremiah 17, planted by a stream, who trusts you, Lord, who believes you, Lord. May we be people who come loss, come unprecedented times unseen before, come pandemics, come drought, come danger, have leaves that do not wither. May we be those who know, who truly know, that we are created, heard, known, empowered, rescued, and promised by you, Father God. Amen. Thank you so much, Emma. I love that in that talk, there was something to receive and something to give. On the receiving side, that beautiful thought that we are known by God, loved by God, we are called by God, just like Jeremiah. And I think that is something to be received, isn't it? God's knowledge of us, his love for us and his call upon us. And whatever God has called us to be or to do, he has also equipped us, that's more to receive. He's equipped us with experience and with knowledge, with gifts and with skills. But then there's the giving side. It's one thing to receive his calling. It's another thing to walk in that calling, to exercise it, to put it into practice, to fulfill it. And uh, whatever our front line that we are called to, whether that's our workplace or where we live or the sports team that we're a part of, just a circle of friends, then we are called 
to be thermostats in those environments changing the temperature rather than being thermometers that simply measure it and state it. So something to receive and something to give. May God bless us and help us to fulfil the calling upon our lives. Now we're coming to the end of our service and we're going to have a song together as our closing worship. So over now to the Ebby worship team. There is strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears You lead us in the morning With a love that casts a fear You are working in our waiting We're beyond our understanding. You are teaching us to trust. Your plans are still the prosperous. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever, perfect in love. You are so
massive thank you from me, I think on behalf of all of us, to all those who have been involved in today's service. But I want to thank you as well for joining us, for being with us. I've loved worshipping with you, I've loved sitting down and listening and learning with you as well. Now if you'd like to just stay a little bit longer and join us in our Zoom room, there's a great opportunity to see other people live on the screen, to chat and just catch up. The link is available here on the screen, also on our church website. So I hope you can join us uh, for this little catch up together. But once again, I just want to say a big thank you to you for joining us. And whether or not you get to join in the Zoom right now, I do hope you can join us again next week. Same day, same time, Sunday, 10.30. May God bless you all.